In machine learning, like in science, the way to evaluate a model is to make new predictions and test them on new data. So in this video, we'll discuss how to make the best use of our data to experimentally validate and improve our machine learning models. Everything we'll be discussing falls under the heading of model selection, which is about picking, among different machine learning approaches, which one will be best for your problem. The first step towards choosing a model is to determine what options are even available for solving a given problem, which leads us to the notion of a model's hypothesis space. For a given machine learning model, the hypothesis space is the types of functions it could represent. Remember that when we train a machine learning model, we are trying to choose among many possible functions the one that best represents our data. And so the hypothesis space describes the sort of functions that could be the result of our training. This is always constrained by the problem we are solving. In particular, the input representation we have chosen for our data may specify the dimension or other aspects of the model and the type of output required by our problem also constrains the possible functions. For example, by requiring them to be discrete in the case of classification or continuous for regression. But different machine learning algorithms and models will also impose constraints on what type of mapping between the inputs and the outputs might be learned. For example, when we looked at single neuron models, the sigmoid classifier always identified a linear decision boundary, and that's a very rigid constraint on the sort of function that could map the inputs to the outputs. If we wanted a nonlinear decision boundary, there are other types of model available. For example, a neural network with more nodes, but the same number of inputs and the same number of outputs, could still perform classification on three-dimensional inputs, but could also divide the space of inputs in more complicated ways than is possible with a single neuron. So thinking about the hypothesis space of a particular machine learning model can serve as an important starting point to deciding whether it's appropriate to the problem that we're solving. But once we've chosen the type of model or the machine learning algorithm that we want to use, there remain a lot of aspects of the model that can be tuned. First of all, whenever we're doing machine learning, we have the parameters of the model that we will train using our data set. That's in fact the whole point of machine learning, that we don't know exactly what function we want, but we can adjust the parameters based on the data. And in the case of the single neuron models that we've seen so far, the parameters that got updated by the training were the weights and the bias of that single neuron. If we had a larger neural net, the parameters would be similar, but now we would have weights and a bias for every neuron in the network. But it's also generally the case that some aspects of the model we're using are in principle tunable, but are not actually being updated when we train with gradient descent. In the single neuron models we've seen, this included the step size, saying how far to go in the minus gradient direction. And in other contexts, this is also known as the learning rate. And when we run gradient descent, it generally takes many iterations to converge to a good model. But we can think of the number of iterations for which we will run gradient descent as another hyperparameter something that we could tune, but is not being directly decided by the training. As our models get more and more complex, we will have more and more hyperparameters available. As soon as we start thinking about neural networks, we'll have to choose the number and connectivity of nodes in the network. And when we're talking about nodes that aren't directly producing the output of the network, we may have a choice of which activation function they should use. And over the course of the semester, we'll encounter many more hyperparameters of deep learning models. 
some of which will have very large effects, and others of which will have effects that depend greatly on the particular problem we're solving. So if we have many possible options for how to set the hyperparameters, or what class of model to choose, we would like to have a systematic way to explore those options and to experimentally test which ones are more effective. And this now lets us define the model selection problem, which is about choosing between different plausible models which one will be best at representing our data set. And this is closely related to the idea of hyperparameter tuning, which is about selecting the values of the hyperparameters that will best represent the data. And my phrasing here is deliberate because these are fundamentally the same problem. There may not always be a clear difference between what constitutes a hyperparameter and what constitutes a different class of model. Sometimes when we talk about different architectures for deep learning, we'll have different ways of organizing the nodes in a neural network, and we'll think of those as different classes of model. But other times we'll vary the number and connectivity of nodes and think of that as a hyperparameter of a particular model. And so in both of these problems, what we're doing is really just trying to figure out among the available options, which will be most effective for our particular problem. And the key idea, and perhaps the most important concept in all of machine learning, is that we can answer these questions experimentally by separating a training set from a test set. If we divide our data set, including both the input examples and the output examples, into one portion that we will train on and a separate portion that we will not train on, then we can use that portion that we held back for out-of-sample validation. And so if we want to decide between two different options for a hyperparameter like the learning rate, we can try training our model on the training set using each of those different parameters, and then test the resulting model using data that it was not trained on. And this is so important because it allows us to experiment on how well our models will generalize to data they haven't seen before. Wanting our models to generalize is important because if we never expected to see new data, there would be no point in doing machine learning in the first place. Our entire goal is to come up with a model that can make good predictions on new data. And so to make sure that we're able to do that, we had better use some of our data to test that our model succeeds in that goal. One of the most obvious, but also most important ways that generalization comes up is in terms of avoiding overfitting. Overfitting is the idea that a model can be trained to be too specific to a particular data set. Here we have a data set with one-dimensional inputs and one-dimensional outputs represented by the black points, and we have two different candidate models trained on the data set. If our only goal were to accurately represent the training set, the blue model would be perfect because it hits every single one of our data points while the red model has a fair bit of error on almost all of the data. But if we were to guess how well we think these models will generalize to a new data point that they haven't seen before, it seems more intuitive to me that the red model might actually be a better prediction than the blue model that has curved way beyond the points it's seen just to fit them exactly. But that intuition that the red model might generalize better than the blue one is way less valuable than an actual experiment that demonstrates which of these is better at predicting data it hasn't seen. So in this case, instead of training on the entire data set, we could randomly pick a couple of points to leave out of the training, and then after we've run our training algorithm on all but those points, we can ask 
which model got closer on the points we held back. A good rule of thumb for how much data to leave out is an 80-20 split. There will absolutely be problems and models where we want to do some other split, but this is usually a good starting point. And we can also compare not just two specific models, but many different possible values for the hyperparameters that we think might make a difference. Sometimes it makes sense to systematically explore all of the possible values of a hyperparameter, but if there are multiple hyperparameters we think might be important, then exploring all possible combinations can be incredibly time-consuming. So the approach that I recommend is to begin by figuring out the plausible range for each hyperparameter. Suppose that you started with a step size or learning rate of 0.01, but you're not sure if changing the learning rate is going to make a big difference. Well, the first thing I would do is try some drastic changes to the learning rate. If you change the learning rate by a factor of 10 in either direction, and don't see much change in the results, that's a good sign that you don't need to be exploring fine gradations of the learning rate within that range. But it may also mean that you want to try variations by even more orders of magnitude, and pushing the parameter until it breaks, and the training does something dramatically different, is often a good way to establish the bounds that it makes sense to even try to explore. But if we think the interaction of several different hyperparameters is going to be important, then just varying them one at a time may not be enough to produce the best model, in which case my advice is to first establish the range for each parameter, and then randomly choose from within that range. The advantage of randomization over systematic search is that it allows you to explore a more diverse range of possible values more quickly, and this can be helpful in narrowing in the plausible parameter values before you make a finer grain search in the areas you think are important. But if we end up trying out tons of different values for several different hyperparameters, there's a danger that we'll actually start overfitting to the testing set because the choice of hyperparameter is now being optimized based on the predictions on the held out set. And if that's the case, it may make sense to split the data even further, which might lead us to split into train, validate, and test sets, which will allow us to set our parameters based on the training set and our hyperparameters based on the validation set, and still have a test set available to make sure that our model generalizes. Finally, there may be some cases where we're not happy with always validating on the same subset of the data, even if we randomized which data went into the training set and which was for validation. And in that case, we can actually use our entire data set for training and for validation by averaging our performance across several different test-train splits. This is the idea of cross-validation, where I have illustrated here fourfold cross-validation. This means splitting the data into four equal size subsets, and then we would train the model on three-fourths of the data and test it on the remaining one-fourth, and then we would do the same thing holding out each of the other fourths of the data, and we can average the performance across those different test sets to make sure that the generalization performance we observed wasn't specific to one particular subset of the data. But cross-validation can also be expensive because it requires us retraining the same model several times on several different data sets. And so often it will suffice to just split our data into training and test, or training validation and test sets. But any of these approaches to model selection would be an enormous improvement over the starting point of training on all the available data and having nothing left over to test whether the model can generalize.